we're going to record. And uh, Emily's out on vacation this week, so I get to hang out with you guys today. Oh, wow. You, know, <laughs> a, you are so lucky. Okay. You poor um, thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to make this interesting for you, Athena. Yeah, spice um, it up. Get crazy. I'll, we'll spice it up. Okay. <laughs> So I uh, seeing the presence of the quorum, I'm gonna call this uh, meeting of the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee to order. It is August 25th and it is 10.31 a.m. And uh, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone um, and instructions will be provided if needed. No person, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Just gonna quickly make sure everyone can be heard. And so starting with Mandy. Present. And Sarah. Yep. And Darcy. Yes. Great, okay, so we're all here. And uh, we have the honor of the council clerk taking the minutes today. Um, so we have basically uh, two items on our agenda and the, the first and most, well, I would say important, but they're certainly one that we've been wanting to get uh, taken care of for some time now is the OCA process. And my uh, intention is to get that done today. We're gonna start with that. Um, and then we have a uh, pr proposed revision to a rule of procedure 5.2 on public hearings. And then we're going to turn to bylaws for future consideration. And um, we do have a set of minutes that I've looked at and we can approve hopefully. So that's what's on the agenda. Uh, and then at the end, we'll take a look into the crystal ball and see what's coming uh, over the next week, uh, next couple of weeks. So I'm gonna start, um, if that's okay with everybody with the, uh, pro the policy uh, document that we've been working on. And uh, I'm gonna see if I can get it to come up on the screen. Um, yeah, there it is. And, um, let's see, that's not what I want. Can everybody see that? Town policy on making recommendations, is that clearly on your screen? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, and I'm going to close this window. So if you need to intervene, just speak up because uh, I need to see the whole thing and it's taking up my entire screen. Um, so what I was going to suggest, but I'm open to other suggestions is that we go through this one last time fairly quickly, I hope, but making sure that we have covered all possible uh, objections or concerns. Um, and making any changes that we may need to make. Um, let me actually get this um, ready for um, track changes are on. So if we need to make changes, we can. At the end, my hope is that I will then um, accept all changes and clean this up and that will be that. So um, unless I hear objection, I'm gonna start. What I did last night is I just sat down and typed up for myself a kind of summary of what this document does or says. And I'm going to um, refer to that and read it a little bit as we go through each of the sections. Um, the first change we've made, I don't know if Darcy was here for that, I just don't remember now, was the title. Um, so the town council policy on making recommendations for town council appointments to multiple member bodies um, is what we've agreed upon as the title. Um, what we've st stated is that this uh, process, or this policy uh, uh, basically begins with a notification on the town's bulletin board that there is a vacancy. And in the uh, first section, number one, we define what a vacancy is. And I have a question about that in just a moment, but let's first of all, take one last look um, at the preamble. Um, so what we state here is that is there herein is laid out the policy to govern how recommendations are made for such appointments, that is appointments to multiple member bodies that are appointed by the town council. Um, and in adopting uniform policy, the council seeks to assure the public that council committees will be consistent over time. A uniform policy will also clarify for applicants or current members who wish to continue to serve, provide clarity. 
I, I would just say yep. that it should say council committee's recommendation policy will be consistent over time. It's so you should probably do the council committee's, okay, recommendation policy. I want to capitalize that or not will be consistent over time because the point I take it Darcy which I think is a good one is that the whole point of this is to make sure that each council committee follows this this policy and set of procedures yeah I I still you know, I've already stated this, but I, I'm still uncomfortable with the fact that we tried to confine it to the recommendation policy rather than it, you know, a policy of the whole town council. But Can we, let's talk about that for a second, because I, um, I want to make sure that if that is an objection or concern, it gets expressed clearly in the report. This is a policy that is being adopted by the entire town council, um, correct? But it right. governs it governs essentially um, basically the process that council committees follow um, when they go about making recommendations to the council. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially it is a council policy and it governs the, the process and procedures for their making recommendations to the town council. So I guess if you can help me just clarify what your objection to, you know, you wish there would be something else and that would be what? Well, what it originally said was just town council policy on appointments to multiple member bodies. And okay. I understand Mandy Joe's uh, wanting to change that to make it just state that it's about recommendations, which I understand that it is, but it's sort of by saying that makes it sound like the council is free to not pay any attention to the criteria that the committees use once it's in front of the council. And why, yeah. what's the purpose of doing it at all if that's the case you know it's like why why are we even going through this mm -hmm. if it's not then but the fact that we've put in place the ability to look at preferences but to then you know right. decide without you know we aren't bound by the preferences even within this process I don't know why we wouldn't be perfectly happy with just saying it's the town council policy, you know? Um, so okay. I, I feel like it's sort of, um, I, I, I feel like it's a, a, an attempt to get around having the policy in the first place. Um, so, you know, right. that's just how I, Feel about it. It's like okay. I, I don't know why we needed to do that. Uh, Mandy, I'll respond. I had a, another comment on this preamble, but um, I, I think just Darcy and I have a fundamental difference in opinion on what a councillor's vote at the council comes from and what it's bound by, and. I don't believe a council can adopt a policy that tells me how to vote and tells me what I need to consider before I vote. I'm elected by the people. I'm responsive to the people, um, not to other councilors per se in how I make my decision on whether I'm gonna vote yes or no. Um, and so a policy as described by Darcy right now that would bind the council and each councilor on what criteria they need to consider on their vote on whether to appoint or not appoint a particular person to me is a is is not just not allowed um, and and could be ignored even if it was adopted because a counselor 
one counselor cannot tell another counselor, you must consider these three things. And if they meet those three things, this is the way you have to vote. That That's just my fundamental opinion. And so that's why to me, this is um, relates to how a committee gets to the recommendation, but cannot, and, and, and I, I could never vote for something that says, and once it's in front of the council, you must consider these five things and only these five things. And if they meet that, you have to vote yes, because I don't even think even if that's adopted, the council could make me follow it. <laughs> so so that that's, and I think that's just a difference between Darcy and I's views. Um, what I was going to say is the second paragraph of this preamble or whatever you want to call it, right. that says it shall apply to all appointments to multiple member bodies as my comment in here says, we yeah. haven't yet followed it for DAB ever. Right. Um, right. And so um, I would delete that whole sentence um, that might give leeway for not um, having to vote an exception 10 years from now, although DAB in theory is only 10 years, but you know, we might come up with another one in three weeks um, because it wouldn't be specifically mentioned in the preamble then. Um, and it, so the preamble mentions planning board ZBA and finance, it would not mention D, DAB and it wouldn't have a all in front of everything and all appointments. Um, but you know, it, it I just get little, rid of that last sentence, leave it at one paragraph, and then the debate can happen whenever um, the council doesn't want to follow it for a random multiple member body appointment that it might have to make. Yeah, I thought about this too. I don't know what, what Sarah thinks. Um, I kind of liked it in the sense that it was a strong statement, but Mandy's correct that we did not follow it in the DAB process. One thought I had was just to add unless exempted or something to that effect by the town council. Another thought I had was just leave it in. And if a DAB type situation occurs, uh, it would be up to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the recommending committee uh, or a counselor to bring it to the attention of the council and say, we'd like to vote on whether we can exempt this particular body from our policy. Um, I could see either one as a way to go. Um, I don't know how the others feel, whether the, I like the sort of saying that this is the policy we're going to follow for multiple member bodies. Um, but Mandy's right, we didn't follow it for DAB, and I think for good reason. So do you want to put in uh, some kind of, you know, unless? Do you want to just leave it as it is? Um, and then just assume that if a problem, if a DAB type situation arises, um, it'll be up to either the chair of the recommending committee or some other counselor to just bring it to the president's attention and ask that it be on the agenda and then have the council decide? Or do you wanna do it as Manny suggests, just take it out? So it seems like there are three options here. Um, any thoughts on that? Mandy, your hand's still raised. Sorry about that. But right. I, I would say okay. I'm okay with adding the phrase unless waived by, the, by majority vote of the town council. Okay, that's one option. Um, and another is to leave it as it is and another is to take it out. Um, does, is there any um, thought anyone way or the other, do people care? I'm gonna put this wording in for the moment, but it's just so you can see it. I like unless waived by majority vote. Sarah's got her hand up. Go ahead, Sarah, please. Sorry, George, I'm not sure if my version of this is old or whatever, but I can't figure out how to raise my hand. Um, okay, all right, thank so you. So I think I'm fine with that wording. And I just, on, on um, the topic that we had just discussed before this, Right. Um, to just to give a little background, um, when we still had a select board, I mean, everybody's seen the original um, policy that select board followed to um, to fill vacancies. And it actually was, I think, kind of vague. And the way that um, the select board did it was really, as Alyssa said, you know, they if they saw an opening, you know, they could call up people that they they thought would be interested or who would be good. Um, they didn't they, you know, uh, an interview could just be a, you know, a select uh, board member just calling on a phone or, you know, if they met informally, like out to coffee. And it was a much more informal process. Um, and it it was I'm going to say it was behind closed doors. It, it not it was just it. 
you just didn't see the whole process mm -hmm. happening. It wasn't like it was necessarily like nefarious. People on the outside just didn't see the whole process. It was not very transparent. Yes. No, no. Yeah. So, I mean, it just wasn't transparent. And right. so on the many years that, you know, I served on other committees, a lot of the things that I heard from people was that they had applied to committees, they had applied to, you know, certain multiple member bodies, and they never heard back whether their, um, their, uh, the SOI they had put in or whatever had even right. been, been received. And then somebody got put on and they didn't even know. So when we first did this, when, when OCA first tried to figure out how this council was going to do this differently, we set up a lot more, you know, a transparent process. And when I wrote up this original ridiculous whole thing about how we would figure out who would be there. And now it does seem a little ridiculous. I honestly tried to address what I had heard from people so that when somebody said, how, how the heck did I not get on? And how did somebody else get on? And how do you make these decisions? Mm -hmm. I tried my very best to make it a fair process. So like, say you were trying to explain to kids how democracy worked or whatever, oh, right. this is how you got chosen. It, it wasn't just because Mary Frances, you know, like the red shirt that you always wore, right? Or you gave her a lollipop, right? So it just, right. this is what came out of it. And I feel like if, if we, if the council I believe the majority of the council is feeling that um, these rules are just baloney. And when it comes right down to how we are going to vote, it's going to be who supports what we support as counselors, right? And that's that's and that is politics. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in one regard, you know, I have to say that I agree with Darcy and the fact that I think that we should somehow be bound to these rules that if you were teaching a kid and you wanted to teach a kid about fairness, that this is what you would put down. However, I understand that we are in politics and there's policies where, you know, we, we make policy and we, we set policy and that's our job. Um, and so when you come down to brass tacks, that's not how we lead. And so that's why I completely understand what, what, Mandy Joe is saying, in the real world, we set policy. And so when it comes right down to it, we're only responsible to the people who elect us, right? Not to some arbitrary rules. Mm -hmm. But the, the autistic justice-ridden childhood side of me says that I feel like what Darcy is saying is, is right. So I just wanted to say that, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to write a report, right. I know that the last thing anybody wants is that a committee member to come out and diss the policy that the entire committee came up with, no. it's hurtful and it's it's bad to do to your committee. So if that could just be written into the policy, I would appreciate it. So thanks. Good, and that's and exactly what I'm trying to capture now in my notes so that it, it comes out uh, expressing um, the concern that you, and it sounds like Darcy also expressing. And I am, so help me here, and we can also talk about it um, afterwards if that's more appropriate. Uh, to get the wording right. But what I'm hearing is that you, both of you would prefer a document that would, uh, to a greater degree, or uh, would bind or govern how counselors actually go about uh, deciding who to approve and who not to approve. Um, I need, we don't have to do it here, but at some point I'm going to need help from one or both of you to articulate this because that's the way I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it as essentially a desire for a policy that um, essentially is, I don't know if binding is the right word, but certainly um, uh, it governs um, or guides, uh, these, these words do matter, um, how counselors actually vote when, um, you, know, you know, voting on a, on a uh, candidate, I'm voting on a recommendation. Um, and that's what I'm hearing. Is that, is that even remotely correct? Or do you wanna think about it? You could send me your thoughts later and I can incorporate it, but that's what I'm hearing. And that's what I would write right now if I were writing this report. So I could send something to you, George, and I would say guides, but I think that it needs to, I would like to make some kind of a statement that says- that's, that I could include that in the report. I'd be just happy. These rules, these rules would, you know, would help too. Okay. Um, well, to, to 
I don't know. I, I can draft something. Darcy had her hand up. Sure, Darcy. Yeah, I just wanted to say that these recommendations also don't bind the committees that are making the recommendations. You know, we have enough language in here to give wiggle room, you know, like tons of wiggle room so that you can get around that right. preference language. That's correct. Pretty, pretty easily, you yeah. know, like there's, so I don't really see how it, um, it doesn't, even if we, even if it were, were applied to the decisions of the council, it still wouldn't bind them. Well, so, um, there, there's, a, let me make a suggestion to both of you or either one of you, which is that you may vote against this um, and then uh, issue a minority report. And it doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but it could just articulate um, some of your concerns or objections. In other words, basically explaining why you voted no. Um, and I'd be happy to include that in the report. Um, so you do have that option. Okay. Um, uh, there are other options we could explore where I just say, well, members had concern about this, that, and the other, and I can do that as well. But a minority report is not, uh, you know, uh, that's certainly an option. And, and you would write it, and I would insert it into the, uh, into the report. Mandy, your hand is up. Yeah, our, our rules don't provide for separate reports. Ah. So whatever uh, gets well, said I need, needs I need to be to in it, one yeah. document. No, it would be in one document, but it would be, uh, I guess I could head it as, you know, uh, minority, uh, well, I don't know. How, how, how would I head it? I, I, I just <laughs> I, I just wanted to say it wouldn't be a separate document. It would all be part of uh, under our council rules of procedure. It would have to be part of George's GOL sure, sure. report. But in the, in the introduction, I would say, you know, I would provide a brief uh, an overview of the, of the document. And then uh, below is is the uh, the uh, minority report of those who voted against it or just something to that effect. And it so, would be in the same document. So George, I just want to, you know, I, we going back to having this discussion in OCA, you know, and one of the things that Alyssa said is that, you know, a committee works together in order to come up with a finished prod, product and that a minority report should not have the same airtime and length and important, uh, importance as what the majority of right. the, so as much as I would love to do to do right. that. I mean, I'm also trying to be really careful that I'm not torpedoing the work that this entire committee did. And that's, you know, this is a hard place for me because I also being chair of OCA and then having people in my own committee come out and say something that was, yeah. you know, that, that was devastating, right? So I'm not sure, I don't want to do that. I and mean, I don't want to have this come out and then be at a committee and then talk trash about it because I think that that's disrespectful to the rest of the members of our committee. And I don't think that it, goes forward, it, it doesn't, I don't think it helps us. Mm. So I'm trying the best that I can to just say what I can. Um, and then this whole thing will come out. The only thing is the same thing that I, I guess I said um, about this when, you know, CRC did it is that, you know, I may vote against it, but I see no reason to expound upon why and torpedo my committee. You know what I mean? I just, yeah. If my conscience says I have to say no, that's fine, but I'm not gonna mess up the majority of my committee by sort of airing my grievances at a town council meeting. So that's that's kind of where I feel betwixt and between on, on trying to, to do this. Okay. Um, Darcy. Sarah, you're so sweet and gracious. <laughs> I need to work on that. But um, uh, yeah, I I, would like to have well i'm assuming as george said that there'll be something resembling a you know the minority opinion on different points of the of the appointment process so i would be glad to help with that if you want me to george I would, um i, would, I want to make sure that whatever it says captures uh either the concerns you know i just would point out right now if we had a vote it's potentially could be two to two. And so we wouldn't oh, be able to right. move. That's right. We wouldn't be able to move forward anyway. So I just point that out as, as it's simply an observation. But however it finally plays out, um, I will obviously make every effort to make sure that, that uh, views are expressed that um, you know, are not necessarily the views of the entire committee, but, but are certainly need to be expressed. Um, uh, so uh, good. I think what I'm going to do at the moment then is uh, we'll see how this plays out in terms of, of, of the process today. 
but if I do go to issuing or uh, creating a report for the next council meeting, I'll be reaching out to both Darcy and, and also Sarah, um, if need be, it sounds like it will be, um, to get their input. And whether it will be a, a minority report or whether it will be simply making clear that their concerns are captured correctly, that's what I plan to do. Is everyone okay with that? Sounds like, okay. Darcy, you hands, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. No. All right. I just wanted to say that I'm not sweet or gracious. <laughs> that, um, that I, for me, I mean, I try. No, I mean, I try, you know, yeah. and I try to be, you know, to be fair. And for me, a lot of this comes out of my trying to be consistent. And I know that when I was chair and it happened to me, it 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 just it it felt devastating. It 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 felt like I we had the committee had worked so hard, and then as a chair, it just it I. It felt like it messed up every single, all the hours the committee had spent and it seemed like a betrayal. And I don't wanna do that to somebody else. So I, I guess it's just my trying to be fair. Maybe I'm gracious, but I'm, I'm not sweet. Okay, well, I'm not, I'm not even gonna go there one way or the other, but um, <laughs> I do think that, um, actually this has not been ridiculous. I wanna make that point right away. This, we've worked very hard on this and I think we have made considerable progress. Though there are certain, I mean, I've certainly made concessions from some of the things that I felt strongly about related to interviews and so forth. Uh, maybe they're not major concessions, but they're concessions. So this, you know, and I think we have uh, come up with at least a process that everyone I hope will agree to. Um, and if we as a committee, as a council vote majority to accept it, then every uh, committee going forward will have to follow at least this process. Um, so for instance, uh, in terms of declaring a vacancy, um, in terms of conducting interviews, in terms of, of, of requiring SOIs, in terms of creating questions in advance, which is something that I've resisted, but I'm willing to, to go along because I think that that's, there's a sense that this is, is needed. Um, so I think a lot has been accomplished here as difficult at times as it's been. There's still, I think, are some differences as we've seen already about sort of what the overall effect or purpose of this policy is. And that is something we can certainly capture in the final report and certainly can be discussed at the council level um, because it's certainly possible that other councilors will agree um, with uh, Sarah and Darcy that, that this is really not accomplishing what they wanted. And so I don't think necessarily that you will be alone in that view. Um, whether you'll be the majority, I don't know, but that a position needs to be articulated. But I do think, aside from that, that we actually have accomplished a fair amount. Um, and as, as to your point, Sarah, of transparency, we can tell people, this is the process, this is how it works, this is where it goes. And as for, as for the crucial issue of, of uh, reappointment, well, we'll come to that in a minute uh, when we get down there. Um, but everything else, I think, is, is pretty locked in. Um, now, you may in the end think that that's just process and doesn't really matter. Um, and that's certainly something that, that can be put in a report or you can talk about a town council. But uh, I want to uh, push back a little bit against your comment, Sarah, that in fact, what you did on OCA and what OCA did has, is really seeing some fruit um, and, and I think real fruit. So um, I, I, I think that's important to say. Um, so uh, if we can continue again, please raise your hand if you have any more to say, but um, I think the preamble now and the title, Darcy, please. Yeah, I just, um, the first paragraph yeah. um, only pertains to certain multiple member bodies uh, uh, that appoint the planning board, zoning board of appeals and non-voting resident members of the count finance committee. Right. So that, sentence in the second paragraph, um, uh -huh. I don't think we want to allow those committees to waive um, the, the policy. So can we put something in there that indicates um, shall also apply to other multiple member bodies um, unless waived by the majority vote or something like that, because we don't want to waive it for our, you know, charter required appointments, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, 
I think the language here, so so the first sentence says such as, so it's not all inclusive, but it, it mentions the ones we do yearly pretty much. Um, the second paragraph would require the council to vote to waive it, even for something like the planning board appointments, the way I read it. Well, it says mm -hmm. certain appoints members to certain multiple member bodies, such as the planning board. Um, uh, so certain implies that's- We don't do all because the town manager does a certain, it, he does yeah, most, most of them. Most of them, right. Right, right but it, that suggests- So instead of such as, could you say, would, would including be better for you? Yeah, including- Instead of such as? Right, including, and then the second paragraph should say, the following policy shall apply to all other appointments to multiple member bodies made by the town council, unless waived by the majority. Well, I, I guess I don't see, because all appointments would include planning board, ZBA, and finance committee, as well as other ones that we make, which, sometimes randomly comes up like this DAB. Um, right, so the second paragraph would discuss other. I guess you're you're trying to, can I, can I get a clarity? You're trying to say, you don't even want the council to be able to waive it for a planning board appointment. The, the say CRC couldn't waive it on its own. Right. The council would have to. Right. And you don't well, want that no, option? No, not even the town council. The, well, the, the, the council, council can obviously can, change its own policy, right? The council can always change its own policy. So it right. could always waive it for planning board. Right. So I guess I'm saying yeah. that I don't want this in here that, that this policy can be waived for those major appointments um, easily because mm -hmm. we have that power anyway. So why would we put it in here? We're just put, we, we're just putting in, this in here because of the DAB. Right. Um, and so that sentence is all about that we can, it also applies to other appointments to multiple member bodies made by the town council, unless waived by the majority vote, like DAB or like something new that might come up. Uh, the, the first sentence doesn't just just states our authority to make appointments. The very first sentence, it doesn't say anything about the policy itself. Although that's the second sentence herein is laid out the policy yeah. to govern how recommendations are made for such appointments. Right. And then I guess to me, this last sentence just reiterates the second sentence of the first paragraph, but then says, but hey, the council can waive it because the council can always waive its own policies by rescinding the whole thing. Right, but aren't we putting that sentence in just because of- um, no, we're Because we're worried about um, some other uh, multiple member body that eventually we might have to make appointments to and like the DAB. And it might be in those circumstances, it doesn't make sense to go through all these various specific steps that we've agreed are appropriate for the other bodies. And so this would allow them to do that. But Darcy's fear is that, well, you can use this then to do it for ZBA and planning board, et cetera. And, let, and, and Manny's response is, but well, we can already, we can do that. We can always, always do it. Let, let me right. give a situation where, you know, and, and I wanna say I'm not advocating for a regular waiving of this for right. typical appointments. Um, but for example, um, we as a council extended the appointment by essentially reappointing two associate ZBA members for three months and two months until what they were hearing was done. We didn't make them interview. We didn't make them do SOIs because they didn't want to continue on for long term, but they were in the middle of a hearing process. If but if we adopt this policy in theory, if we don't waive that, they'd have to do an SOI and an interview for a simple two month extension. Um, you know, th that's just another example of where a council like might say, hey, yeah, because right. anytime we extend, we're actually technically appointing. Um, and so there's, there's, I think oftentimes, or um, ZBA now has 
one to two associate members open. Um, I fully intend to follow whatever process is either adopted or if we need to, I'm gonna start as CRC chair trying to get those at least people applying to them. If something came up like the DAB where ZBA was having problems getting quorums because so many people were gone and someone had an application and we wanted to do something quickly temporarily, we might as a council decide it makes sense to waive it on a short-term basis for an associate appointment to the ZBA, for example. Um, so I, mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I go with the, I get what Darcy's saying, but whether we leave it in there or out there, the council can always waive it whether or not we expressly say it, no matter which appointment we're making. And I think the statement is, has this, the force of strength of saying, I mean, certainly from my perspective, that this would have to be an extremely unusual circumstance. And, for, and, and again, maybe this isn't strong enough for Darcy, but you know, the idea that somehow uh, members of the council would, would want to just waive this entire process because they want to sort of like, like uh, you know, packing the Supreme Court. They want to put in their, their preferred candidates and just that would be intolerable to me. And I would like to think it would be intolerable to my colleagues. Um, but if it did happen, it would be the voters that would, would hopefully exercise their, 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 uh, their franchise and carry, and, and carry out the uh, execution of those, of those counselors uh, through, through the Democratic, through the poll. So uh, I guess, I don't know, Darcy, I don't know if this helps or not, but um, uh, I like keeping it in because it does say, this is the policy we shall follow. Um, but it does give a little bit of flexibility that uh, may be needed and was needed recently for DAB. And as Mandy's given us some examples where it might be needed uh, you know, in the future. Um, if someone wanted to just throw, you know, said, let's just skip this entire policy and just, you know, bring somebody to the council and vote on them um, without any extenuating circumstances, that would be outrageous. And, and I would think most of my colleagues would share that. And I'm not sure you could put that into a set of, in a policy document. Um, so I don't know, is that convincing to you or would you prefer that we could just drop it? We could take the entire sentence out. I would just take out the, take out the uh, new language because like, um, we all agreed the council can uh, can you know waive a policy um, by majority vote anyway. So right. why would we put this in here? It it seems to negate the whole darn thing. You know, it's like okay, this is a policy, but we can waive it. Okay. Um, I'm going to channel Alyssa here, which is and even Kathy sometimes, which is. You put it in there so people don't forget you can, not because you're encouraging it, right? Like this was, as we sat on the rules of procedure, it's like, well, it's in the charter and everyone was like, well, put it in the rules too. So you don't have to go 12 different places. So that's my challenge, my, my channeling of other counselors on why it might make sense to leave it in. Right, but I mean, it, it undermines the whole purpose of doing this is that we're, we're trying to make a consistent policy and <laughs> I guess. Okay, so you feel it's sort of self undermining self. Uh, yeah, yeah like, I don't, yeah. It's our I, policy, but you can waive it. Well, <laughs> well it's, it's there because um, first of all, it's, it's making a strong statement that, that this is a policy we intend to apply to all appointments. And, it's, and the proviso unless is there because um, there could be circumstances um, that we've already mentioned where it would make sense for the council to do this. So uh, I mean, I guess the third option was my original, one of my three options was, was just leave it as it is with the understanding that um, if these situations arise, it'll be up to the chair of a recommending committee or some counselor to bring it to the council and ask that we waive it for X, Y, or Z reason. Um, and so that was kind of your point, Darcy. It's, it's sort yeah. of implied anyway. Yeah. I kind of become fond of this now, the way it's stated, but I could go back to the, just to leave the sentence as it is. Um, Mandy, I think, likes the way it's stated. Um, I kind of like the way it's stated. Sarah, do you have any strong feeling on it? Would you prefer to just have the sentence without this unless clause 
would you prefer to keep it or do you care? I, I think we can, I, you know, I guess we can keep it because my, my feeling is, is that I, I see the fact that, you know, I agree. I want this to be something that when people come to town council or new town councilors, they don't know what to do. They don't know how we do things. Having something that's an instruction manual is incredibly helpful. And if they do, if they have something like DAB where everybody's like, I, I don't know, do we have to do this? They'll know that they, they can't. And I think the other thing is, is that the way this this is written, and I agree, we have all worked very hard for three years to come up with something we could all live with. Um, I'm not gonna even say that, I don't think it's helpful. I think it's okay the way it is because I, I, I do think that it, it is more instructive to, especially to new counselors. And I think that counselors will do what they will with things. So I'm willing to let go of that here and, and have faith. I think it also might be valuable for the public because we will put out an FAQ eventually, uh, an appendix or whatever you want to call it, that will be a public facing document in addition to this, where people will go to just get, we can send them or they can go themselves and say, okay, here's, here's how it works. And it might be, I think it's valuable to have the public know that we do have the authority to waive this. Um, and so it also makes that point. So if they say, what the, you know, what happened? How come you got to, how come you did this with the DAB? How can we do this with some other body, whatever, or with these people who are only going to be appointed for two months? And we could say, well, take a look at the preamble. Um, we do have the right to waive it. And hopefully we'll give you good reasons why we did. And if we don't have good reasons, you should definitely, you know, consider finding some other counselors to be a representative because they do things for, for not very good reasons. So I'd, I'd like to leave it, um, Darcy, if that's okay. Um, we could have a vote, but it sounds like it's right now three to one. Um, I'd like to leave it in there, um, if you don't mind. And it, you can certainly object if you wish, or we can put it in the report, but um, that, that you find it sort of self, self-defeating. Yeah, I stated my opinion. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, next section, section number one, simply uh, identifies what, we, what a vacancy is, distinguishes between a vacancy, a full stop, and an impending vacancy, um, and requires that, um, that it, when the vacancy is uh, occurs, that uh, certain steps have to be taken. Um, town bulletin board. I think the language is fine. I don't have any problem with this. Does anyone have any concerns about this? Um, the one question that did come to my mind was the is still not clear uh, to the public, let alone to me, um, what the actual procedure is supposed to be for someone who wants to. Um, uh, leave, uh, resign from a body. Uh, sending an email message to Lynn, sending an email message to the, uh, it should be, I, I see the hand of the council clerk. And my thought was sending a message to the council clerk would be the appropriate way to do this. Um, but it's not stated anywhere and maybe it doesn't need to be. Um, Athena, your hand is up, please. I'm not sure if it is, I would have to look and see if it is stated somewhere locally, but um, my understanding is that resignations must be filed with the town clerk's office in order to be officially received by the town. So until that happens, and I've asked yeah. Sue yeah, um, no when the town clerk's office so, receives I mean, resignations sure for council appointed bodies to um, copy me so that I can inform the council, but they have to be filed with the town clerk's office in order to be official. They have a book of resignations. So I guess the question to my colleagues is whether this needs to be in this document because um, at least with uh, resignations, um, they're not official until they actually get filed with the town clerk in some kind of an email, I assume is sufficient or a letter, or whatever, but some kind of written statement. You know, it, it, it might be in the board and committee handbook. Now that I think of it, it may have been there or in some of the materials that the, the clerk's office hands out when they swear new folks in. I'd have to ask Sue to, okay. to refresh my, my colleagues, memory. do you feel this is something we need to get into or not? Um, yeah, or should it go into the FAQ? Um, that's the one that occurred to me. It was just, what do we do about, you know, uh, resignations? Um, obviously, somebody dies or, you know, uh, somebody doesn't seek reappointment. That's a different matter. But um, a vacancy occurs whenever the town clerk, well, it's here, isn't it? A vacancy occurs whenever the town clerk receives a signed resignation 
So it's here actually. So what am yeah. I? And, yeah. and the last Sorry. sentence, I would say we should just fix the last sentence. An impending vacancy occurs whenever a member informs the council of their intention to resign. Yeah, that's so I guess what I, yeah. It, it informs the town clerk of their intention to resign. Because you can that's, submit that resignation for two months in advance, right? Like, and so yeah. you're going to serve out two months and then be done. That's an impending vacancy in my mind. Okay, I think that solves the problem. I'm sorry, that sentence was right in front of me, wasn't it? Um, so, um, and are people okay with that? In other words, that is the, the one and only and the official way you can't just, you know, telling me uh, at the uh, baseball game that you're quitting such and such a body or sending me an email or sending one to your favorite counselor or to Lynn um, or even to Athena is not, the rule you have to send you should copy them hopefully <laughs> so they know i mean that's the other concern is they send a letter to the town clerk and then they don't copy anybody so the clerk knows but nobody else does so that's not good so so it's here I, i've asked i've asked sue to, to let us know let me know so that i can forward to the council when there's a council appointed vacancy that she's yeah. received a resignation right, right, right. and the, the intention um would be the resignation itself you can you can resign um, with the date and the resignation, but I, I don't know if I would call that an intention. It's that's the resignation letter. Okay, and it is the town clerk, and that's it. That's what you got to do, and um, that applies to our appointments as well as to any others. Town manager. So, okay. Well, since I'm the one that messed that up, and I like to think I'm a reasonably intelligible, intelligent person, I think that it's really good to put it in there because I think you know we mentioned it, but until you actually resign, you're like. Who the heck do I tell? You know, you want to tell, like you said, you know, you think you would CC. And to me, it was like, well, I'm going to tell the town council president and the town manager, like they deal with me. I'm, the clerk never deals with me. So right. when you're in that situation, I don't think you're always thinking clearly either. Cause if you're, you know, if you're resigning, it's probably because something else is happening in, in, in your life that's maybe distressing or taking your attention. So right. I think it would be great to have it there for people to find. Right. And I, I would also say put it in whatever the FAQ is, but with with um, Athena's thing of their intention to resign, we could say of their resignation at a future date or you know something like that instead of intention. Where is that in the paragraph? The, the, the impending vacancy occurs okay. whenever a member informs the town clerk of their intention to resign. Um, Athena seemed to think intention was wrong. So we could say of their resignation effective at a future date or something. So impending vacancy occurs whenever a member informs the town clerk of their resignation. Of their <laughs> resignation. Resignation That's on a, a future effective date. No, I'm they not could, sure we need they that. They sometimes yeah. say effective immediately or effective on a specific date, but it could be right. So just of their resignation. I'm not sure we need the rest of it, Mandy. What do you think? Do we well but then it repeats the sentence before it a vacancy occurs when the town clerk receives a signed resignation. Mm -hmm. And so what's the difference then, right? Maybe impending is just when a member's term expires. Um, so, um, right. Your thought is something yeah. like that, that. Can we just put what that should include? Can we just include, I don't know, with yeah, I mean, what's uh, the resignation right? should include uh, the the date of your I don't know what it'd be actual resignation and the 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 date that you're sending it. That's I'm not sure. No, that's yeah. I think maybe it's just a, an impending vacancy. Essentially, is when a member excuse me when a member's term is expiring, unless uh, regardless of whether that member seeks reappointment, a vacancy occurs when someone has uh, the town clerk gets their signed resignation. That's, that's a vacancy. Um, it's not impending, it's a vacancy. Um, and um, set, a member passes away or a member is removed from the body in accordance with the charter section, da, 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 da. Um, I guess the thought of an impending vacancy um, is when a member is informed the town clerk that they're going to resign, say in, in, in two weeks or whatever. Um, but do we really need to get that, right? I mean, once they send their letter of resignation, they're out, um, whether it's tomorrow or two weeks or three weeks or whatever. Um, Just say so. intended resignation. 
Um, so your thought is they might change their minds. Is that the concern? Well, it just puts it in the future. Um, but, uh, and the other thing is, why are we talking about the town clerk when we should be saying the clerk of the council? Because uh, currently the rule is that it is the town clerk who gets these, these resignation letters. It goes to the clerk, not to the to town clerk. Right, excuse me, oh, it goes to the oh. town clerk, not to the council clerk. But that is pre-town council, right? That's true. Um, I, I think part of it is um, the clerk of the council is not who swears in our appointments. The town clerk is. And okay. so while we're the ones that make the appointment, the official records of the town are kept with the town clerk on appointments, no matter who did the appointment. And so the official resignation would be kept with the town clerk. Right. Hmm. I think it's just a process question there, but I still want to make sure that this is clear and whether um, are people bothered by the thought that someone has submitted their letter to the town clerk saying, I'm going to resign from this body, say in two weeks, and hence it now becomes a vacancy. Um, but then a, a week later, they change their minds <laughs> um, and say, you know what, I'm gonna rescind my letter. Um, I, I guess they can do that, I, I don't know. Um, I, it seems like it'd be an unusual situation to say the least, um, but does, do we need to get into that kind of level of detail? Um, what's important about impending vacancy is that it essentially identifies that um, that applies to all expiring terms, right? That's an impending vacancy. So, um, and that's certainly something that we as chairs who have dealt with this in the past, you have somebody apply for a position and you know that, that, uh, that a current member is going to seek reappointment and you know that there is this preference Nonetheless, um, this gives you uh, a clear set of instructions to tell them that we treat all uh, vacancies as, as impending, and we treat these as impending vacancies. So, um, so I guess that's my, I'm just thinking just say an impending vacancy occurs whenever a member's term I'm just going to put a strike through here for a moment. And I want you to weigh in as to whether you want to change this or not. So an impending vacancy occurs whenever a member's term, get rid of that, a member's term is expiring. And everything else is treated as a vacancy. And if in the rare circumstance that somebody changes their mind, Okay, but we're not gonna get into the thoughts on that. George? Please. Since I, I guess we're all channeling Alyssa, I think her nose must be itching or... <laughs> <All right. laughs> I think that she would probably say that maybe we should put um, like a reference to the handbook or wherever it is that explains like what needs to be in a resignation letter and who it goes to. So maybe we refer it to. Well, that can go in the FAQ. Um, remember, this is a document for the council and the council's policy. But I'm also yeah. wondering, George, yeah. if we, if, if some, some of us are like, hey, how come you didn't tell so-and-so or like, why does it, I mean, I just think that as counselors, we should also know how that happens because we didn't right, i mean right. this is just me i'm a town counselor and i don't know if all of us knew exactly what i was supposed to do so i just think that when we're trying to make these decisions and vacancy decisions i think it's good for counselors to then be able to look and know what the process is and i, I could be it could be overkill but well this is not a decision if we do this right it's it's simple i mean it's just, it's telling us what it's telling you or me or whoever the chair is this is what a vacancy is Okay. Um, and it's not, we don't need to decide it's, it, this is what it is. Um, and, uh, your thought or concern is, that, no, no, it's, let's carry it out. Your thought or concern is that, okay, how does everybody else find out about this? How does the chair, how does the, you know, uh, and do we want to get into that level of detail? I guess that's the question. Any thoughts, uh, Darcy, please. 
I was going to make a comment on something else. Okay. Um, further, let's come back to you in a moment. Um, I have stricken that phrase, and now we have simply a vacancy occurs whenever the town, town clerk receives a signed resignation from a member of the body. Yeah, I have a comment about that. Okay, go ahead. Um, that's not the only time when there would be an impending vacancy. I think it makes sense to say when a member informs the town clerk of their, like say, planned resignation or a member's term is expiring because there's plenty of people who leave in the middle of a term and they know that they're leaving because they're moving away from town or whatever. Right, and right, and they, right. um, you know, they say, okay, you know, I'm going to be leaving in December, blah, 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 right. you know? Right, right. I like uh, planned resignation, Darcy. I like that word planned. So I'm okay with putting that in front of the word resignation and leaving right. it in. And so, to yeah. Sarah's point, I don't think it harms us to put a footnote somewhere in this document that links to the handbook or whatever it is, which I'm not sure has been updated since we even took office, but yeah, um, no, it yeah. at least links to something that that says, um, it, I, I don't even know where I'd put it in the document, but something that says committee members, it receive, you know, appointed multiple member body members receive the appointed committee handbook found at X, Y, or Z or something. I don't, I don't think yeah. it hurts. Um, well, it just yeah adds another, but okay. Let's let me make a note that, a that we want a footnote link here to the handbook. Um, I'm sending you a link now, George. Thank you. Um, but I'm still struggling with um, these the idea of planned resignation. It sounds like you'd like to insert the word plan. I think here. it goes to the concern of the resignation is not not effective for two months, but you know we can start. The appointment process now so that there isn't you know that that there's a smooth transition just like we do for the term expirings we start them before there's actually a vacancy because we don't want a two month long gap um, but okay and but, so if we know yeah. someone's leaving you can start that process and if they then renege on their resignation you inform the candidates, but if they don't, there you've you've stopped the gap from happening. So why is that not captured in the very first part of this sentence? A vacancy occurs whenever the town clerk receives a resignate signed resignation from a member of the body. Because so, yeah, I ahead. guess I see a vacancy as open now. Whereas if I say to the clerk, I'm resigning this position effective. December 31st, it's not vacant right now. I'm still a valid member. Right. But, but it's impending. Right, There's right. an expectation that it will be vacant as of January 1, but it's not vacant now. All right. Um, so it seems like there's a desire to make a distinction between someone who sends a letter to the clerk saying, I quit right now and someone who sends a letter to the clerk saying, I'm quitting on such and such date, and the one is a vacancy and the other is an impending vacancy. Um, and so an impending vacancy then becomes, keeping that strict and phrase, an incoming, an impending vacancy um, becomes, occurs whenever a member informs the town clerk of their planned resignation or a member's term is expiring, regardless of whether that member's to yeah. And yes, I, yes. Okay, I'm still struggling with this, but let me put it in here. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's all right, uh, it's okay. Um, because I'm reading this and I'm thinking, what's the difference between a signed resignation and a planned resignation? Both of them are documents that have to be submitted to the town clerk. Right. By the way, uh, when I send an email to the town clerk, I, I can't sign it. I mean, you guys are sophisticated, probably you can sign it. So that's a whole nother issue. I, I would assume that just sending an email to the town clerk saying, I, you know, George Ryan, uh, I am now resigning or I, I plan to resign or am resigning from this body on such and such a date. And then I just type my name. I consider that to be sufficient. 
is there is that a problem? I mean, you, obviously, you the old days. You can get rid of the word know. signed if you want. I mean, does it, you know, I just wonder technically uh, from the point of view of the town clerk, um, you know, do they really, I assume in practice, they don't require an actual signed letter. I assume just an email is sufficient as long as they can keep it in their records. Um, so uh, that's the first question. The second is, I still struggle to see. So, so Smith is going to, resign in, in, in two weeks or, four, or a month or whatever. And Mandy's point seems to be, and Darcy's point is, well, then the recommending committee can get to work right now, sort of, um, you know, preparing to fill that position. Um, I guess I don't see why that isn't just covered by the first sentence first clause and right uh, i think we're just trying to be inclusive george and if we add it back in we're good and we could move on okay well i'm the only one having a problem here so i'm <laughs> going to shut up um, so i'm going to uh, take this out I, i'm going to remove the stricken bit and add the word planned and town clerk okay i uh, get rid of that Okay. We can go on to the next. Community activity form. The only change was inserting the word of. I am aware that two members, uh, Pat and Darcy, are not happy with the fact that CAFs continue to be um, treated as personnel records. But other than, and we have made don't we say it in here that we make the, uh, let me see, yeah, we make a couple of important statements actually. It's only two years now. And the reasoning was that it just, it's just too burdensome um, to have three years and two years is adequate. Um, and it's two years from the publication of the bulletin board notice. So um, that's how you would calculate your, your two years. And that we're also requiring that everyone submit a new CAF, whether they are seeking reappointment or not. And the argument there was that this now alerts town councilors in real time as to who is uh, seeking to be part of the applicant pool. Whereas in the old days, um, yes, Smith submitted a CAF you know, a year or two ago, but nobody's gonna remember that. But our current procedure that's sufficient to be included in the pool. What we're suggesting is what we have suggested, and please correct me if I'm misstating this, is that by requiring everyone to submit a CAF, once the bulletin board notice has been put up, counselors then um, across the board will be aware of who the various candidates are. So that was the argument for doing that. Now, that does mean, this thought occurred to me, that say Smith, you know, out of the blue submits a CAF uh, two weeks or, you know, whatever before um, we actually declare a vacancy and it gets posted on the bulletin board, we're going to have to go back to Smith and say, yes, I know you just submitted a CAF two weeks ago, but we're going to ask you to resubmit it. Um, I don't think that's, it's a little irritating, but I think it's probably a price worth paying. Thoughts on that? Is that a correct description of what we've agreed to do? Is that a correct description of the rationale behind it? And do you share any concern about, you know, say Smith, who, who just submitted a CAF, but unfortunately prior to the bulletin board notice? I, I think the CAF is so easy now because we require SOIs that I right. don't think it's a, it's a, it's not asking really, too much, really not easy. asking too much. Yeah. 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 Okay. I just wanted to point that out that that's a possible scenario. And Smith might be somewhat irritated, but we would try to explain it to them. Okay. Which would be such a good thing to know about someone who's applying for a committee or anything. They got that upset. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just file that away. Um, sufficiency of the pool. Um, so, um, all right. 
I think this is, we just made some slight changes to this, but I think the language is fine. Anybody have any concerns, problems, issues with this sufficiency of the pool? We cannot declare a pool sufficient for at least two weeks after the bulletin board notice is put up. And, um, okay. And we have to declare it by majority vote. And we can continue to do outreach even after we've done that because the pool is still open. This will be something that's important that we all agree on. I think we do. The pool will not actually close officially until the SOIs are put up um, on a public posting. So the pool stays open. Section four, uh, excuse me, yeah, selection guidance. Um, I think this is, I have no problems with this. I don't know if anybody else does. We spell, spell out the format and the purpose here. We make clear we do not take resumes or attachments. And we do make the point, this is again, maybe we want to discuss this, failure to submit the SOI by the deadline may result. So it does give the recommending committee or the chair or whoever it is, some flexibility to rescue someone who has, for whatever reason, missed the deadline. And where is that, George? Uh, let's see if it should be in here. I hope you're it's getting ahead of yourself, George. We're on selection guidance and you're talking about SOIs. I'm sorry. I yeah, apologize. I think that's in seven. I apologize. I, I noticed that. I apologize. Um, so back to selection guidance. Any concerns here? I think we've been through this a lot, but. Um, uh, Pat. Input from the body's chair. We pretty much narrowed this down to um, if there's any preferred knowledge and or expertise to meet current needs. So we're not, um, it's pretty specific. So the recommending chair or their designee is not supposed to just send out a general email saying, you know, well, tell us, you know, what do you think about this? So it would be fairly specific. We're requesting from the chair if there's any preferred not. Is there, are people happy with this? Okay. Okay. Reappointments. Um, again, this we've gone over this earlier. This is, I think, an area of some disagreement um, at the moment. Um, we're trying to basically satisfy both both views by stating that there is a preference, um, but at the same time um, stating that there is no obligation either for the candidate or for the recommending committee to offer reappointment. And that um, their current service and experience on the body will be considered as part of the process for making a recommendation. Any thoughts, concerns with this? Again, we've gone through it, but okay. Number six, we added, we're requiring that there be a multiple member body handout that there, that each of the bodies that we appoint have a handout. And uh, we are asking the chair of the recommending committee to ensure that it's up to date and available on the town's website. Now for these bodies, the website is actually the official uh, finance committee website, the official, right? So we're not asking that there be a separate, that not be listed on a council website, but that it be on a, um, a town website. That's all we want, okay? All right, seven, statement of interest. Um, so we're requiring this of all applicants. We describe the uh, format and the intention. All right. So, and that they are to, we will be sent the selection guidance um, in advance. There will be a deadline and 
And this is the, the answer to Darcy's question. This is where the word may is. Right, yeah, that. Yep, go um, ahead. That allows too much um, difference in the way that the committees uh, treat their applicants. Um, okay. So that allows one, one committee um, to give additional chances to people that they like or okay. Okay. not. Okay. Um, so you would prefer that this state that an applicant who does not submit their SOI by the established deadline will be withdrawn from the applicant pool? Um, that's what it said previously. Yeah. No, either either, either, um, either we allow them to submit late or we don't, one or the other, you know, like, but not, I don't think we just say, well, you know, depending on who it is. <laughs> you know, well, well, I guess the thought was there could be some extenuating circumstances, you know, illness, death in the family, accident. Uh, I don't know. I guess granted that they will have had, say, at least two, hopefully at least two weeks notice. Um, and maybe they waited to the last minute and that's on them. Um, it's kind of like student papers. Uh, you know, you knew about this for a whole semester. <laughs> now you tell me that you got sick the week before it was due. Um, I don't know. Any thoughts? Mandy, your hand. Go ahead. I just wanted to explain because I was the one that that sought for this. Um, yep. And I wanted to explain if it's not a may, if it's a shall, the policy itself is internally inconsistent uh, um, and something else needs changed. And that's why we ended up with this may here for a couple of reasons. Um, as George just said, this applicant pool under a separate section is set to close at the posting of the public SOI. Right. Yet this says you're withdrawn if you don't submit your SOI by the right. SOI deadline. Those are internally inconsistent. And one of the inconsistencies is not necessarily for someone who had two weeks notice. It's potentially someone who submits their CAF three days before you intend to post the SOIs. Um, and the applicant and the SOI deadline is that day at noon, say. Um, and maybe you as a chair didn't even look for that email or something yet you didn't weren't going to post for a couple of days um and so then that person who's submitting that caf technically within the time period that they're still considered in the applicant pool is no longer in the applicant pool if the statement of interest can't be accepted late per se um and so my goal for suggesting some changes was basically to try and make the policy internally consistent somehow mm -hmm. so um, when does the applicant pool close at the posting of the applicant names or at the deadline stated by the chair for when SOIs are due? If it's at the posting, then there should be some sort of little bit of leeway for a statement of interest that comes in late for some reason. I, I, I in some sense, I don't mind which way it goes. Mm -hmm. It's just, I want the policy to be consistent. consistent. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Why don't we just say shall be withdrawn um, unless there are extenuating circumstances or something like that? Well, the way, given the current deadline being when it's posted officially, um, the SOIs are publicly put up on, on for the public to see. If we keep that as the absolute deadline, which has a certain kind of logic to it, right? Um, while there is a deadline for SOIs and people are expected to meet it, if for whatever reason they fail to meet it, it does give um, the recommending committee and or their, their designee, the chair, whatever, um, the opportunity to still keep them in the um, applicant pool um, as long as they get the SOI in time to put it up, post it. Um, so it gives them, a, I guess your concern, Darcy, is that could be abused by uh, a chair or their designee um, for somebody that they favor. Whereas if you have this sort of, you don't get the SOI in by this date, that's it. And then all we do is go back and change the other statement. I think it's later, actually, that says that, um, you know, uh, uh, just take that out. So the deadline isn't. Um, when they're posted publicly, 
the deadline is the deadline set by the committee, whatever that is usually set by the chair. Um, right. May just allows different treatment. Um, and, you know, I guess one you, you of my yeah, you don't policy is just to have uniform treatment of our applicants, you know? Right, right, right. You don't think that giving that kind of, of little breathing room would actually be beneficial not only for applicants, but also for um, the committee. And that if a committee chair or the designee um, didn't, you know, chose not to act, even though they had the opportunity to do it, that would be a serious problem, A, with their committee, um, and then B, perhaps even later with the town council. So uh, I, I guess I'm struggling with, you know, uh, yeah. Mandy? Let me just put another hypothetical up. The policy itself states that the um, applicant pool is closed seven days beforehand, essentially, or that, that there's no leeway in the policy for when the SOIs and the applicant names need posted. That is a minimum of seven days beforehand. It can be eight or nine, but there's a minimum. Yeah. Um, and that's set by the policy, whereas the statement of interest deadline is set by a chair. So as a chair, is there anything stopping me from saying, well, the deadline's Sunday at five, and then at 5.05, .05, it comes around and I've got two, but I was expecting four. So I go, well, I've just changed in my head the deadline to Monday at six. I'm not sure this policy stops me from doing that, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of the same, you know, I, I, if the chair is setting the deadline, the right. chair can always change the deadline um, right. as long as the ultimate policy deadline of posting the names is met. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think personally, the, yeah. the, a little leeway to say, oh, they missed the formal deadline is, is almost the same as the chair just changing the deadline on the fly because the ultimate deadline is only when the chair essentially says to, asks the town, the clerk of the council to post the SOIs. That's essentially the deadline. And is there any way we could change that that would be satisfactory in your mind? In other words, to make the deadline, the, the date that the chair somewhat arbitrarily, but hopefully reasonably chooses, and that's just it. And um, whereas the seven days before has a certain kind of finality and sort of you know, it's got nothing to do with the chair likes or doesn't like. That's just the way. That's it's just got. what it is. That's why I liked yeah. this sort of leeway. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I understand what Darcy's saying, but yeah. um, for example, a lot of when the chair asks the clerk to post it is based on the chair's availability. And so when I'm setting an initial deadline for an SOI, it's based on when I hope to get to asking the clerk to post the stuff that doesn't, you know, and so it might change for different committees based on what my schedule the next day is or something. Um, so you like this because it gives you as a chair or the designee a little bit of breathing room flexibility. Yeah, because um, if, yeah. if I didn't have this, I might say, well, I'm going to accept SOIs until the very last minute of when I have to, when I fully have to send it to the clerk. Um, whereas right now I can set that deadline a little earlier. We already know who intends to submit it. If I don't get them, I have a little bit of leeway um, to, to either reach out or not, or if something happens, I, you know, I, I get the concern. I really do. Yeah, um, yeah. But we also have to recognize that the chairs that are doing the bulk of this have lives. Um, <laughs> and, and they were elected chair hopefully because the committee trusts them to do the right thing. And they're responsible um, to their committee. So if something yeah. does happen and a uh, member says, wait a minute, Mandy, uh, I know that so-and-so sent something to you and yet it didn't get posted. What's going on here? So yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think there's also that aspect. So Darcy, please. Um, I, I hear what Mandy Jo is saying. Uh, but I guess I didn't have full understanding of 
the fact that the the chair has the discretion to set the deadline. It seems like that. Um, what would be the downside of just saying that the deadline is the posting date? And I I heard what you just said that that doesn't give you much leeway, but you could like encourage people to get them in earlier than that. Um, I guess I just so let me give an example. CRC yesterday had a meeting that in theory could have been exactly two weeks or one week before another meeting where interviews were taking place. I was not at home all day. So the deadline of yesterday, if that was the day I also had to get them posted, would not have allowed me to get them to the clerk in time to process them because the emails, some, sometimes they come in as emails and not, you know, like they need processed, they need put on SharePoint, they need, there's a lot of work that goes into getting them ready to go to the clerk for posting. Um, and that takes time. And I wouldn't have had the time yesterday because, and, and that happened to be because of council stuff. Um, and so the deadline couldn't be that day. And who knows whether the clerk's even available that day, right? Like the clerk's, Athena always recommends we get things to her two days in advance so that we don't miss posting deadlines, you know, that it doesn't always work out that way, but you just, it, we have lives and we have other obligations that you, you, you know, um, it takes time. And so a deadline of an SOI, the day, you know, at 10 a.m. the day it needs posted means I have to be around between 10 and noon to get it to the clerk and the clerk has to yeah, be right, right. not in an emergency right. between noon and four to get it posted. You know, it, it, no, it is, yeah, it so, doesn't, right. Yeah. So how about um, uh, 48 hours uh, or two business days prior to the posting date or something like that so that it's uniform and um mm -hmm. would that would that work um well again they're weekends and you know it's just 48 I, I, I hours hear, for crc yeah. is a friday so you lose the complete weekend for people whereas mm -hmm. i tend to make it a sunday night to give them the whole weekend all right. All right. 40 out 48 business days 48 business hours two business days for a CRC meeting that occurs on a Tuesday is a Friday or sometimes a Thursday if there's a Monday holiday. And I try to, depending on when the things are, give them to Sunday night if possible or Saturday night. I, I had a deadline that was um, Memorial Day weekend. So, you know, like one of the deadlines was Memorial Day weekend and posting deadlines with Memorial Day. So it's it's highly, I think time specific and all. That's why I'm just asking for some leeway. Some little flexibility. Yeah. A little yeah. flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I think there, well, okay. Your hands are up there, so please go ahead. Oh, sorry. No. All right. I'd like to leave the May in um, and provide the flexibility for the reasons that Mandy stated. Um, I do think a chair is, is ultimately responsible to his or her committee um, and has to be able to explain why they do what they do and when they do it. And um, if they act in an arbitrary or, um, you know, uh, capricious manner, um, they're going to be accountable to their committee, first of all, and then eventually to the council and then so. eventually to the voters. So um, this is really, I guess, a concession to the challenge, particularly for CRC. Um, which faces, um, and with GOL, it's far less a, an issue, um, but it just gives the, uh, the recommending committee chair or designee a little bit of breathing room. Um, and that we just keep, yeah, we keep the, uh, the absolute drop dead date is the, the point at which they get publicly posted. Okay. Can you give me an example of when, um, a, a chair would decide to withdraw someone from the applicant pool if right. their if their application is late. I guess it would probably be a situation where the SOI comes in and um, they're simply not around, 
um, or uh, you know, it, they're just or the clerk is not around. In other words, they waited to such a late point. Um, well, that, yeah, I, I can give an example. For right. the most recent, I think it was ZBA appointments. Um, the SOA deadline was a Sunday night. I didn't even check Sunday night. I didn't even look at my email till midday Monday. And by the time I looked at my email, there was an SOI in there Monday morning. It was not submitted Monday morning, not Sunday night. And I accepted it. Um, I think I think it was ZBA, not, not planning board. Um, and I accepted it because I hadn't even looked. Like that delay had nothing to do with me at all um, and, and did not affect my actions on when I was going to post things at all. Um, another example for a planning board, the deadline was coming. It was like four hours or five hours away and I had not received an SOI from a person I was expecting to receive some from. I emailed that person and said, your deadline's coming up, um, what's going on? You know, I just wanna make sure you need, know you need to submit one if you wanna be considered. And I would have, if that person had not met that deadline, if they had met the next day, I would have accepted it. Um, you know, because I'm trying as chair to be as accommodating as possible to things. Um, so I personally don't see myself, the only time I see myself not accepting an SOI that is late is when I've already sent the materials to the clerk for posting. Um, you know, and I see myself if I haven't gotten SOIs from people I expected to, and this process with resubmitting re CAFs and all makes that even much more clearer of who you probably expect to get an SOI from. That deadline comes and goes, emailing them saying, hey, what happened? We had a deadline. Are you withdrawing or you got till tomorrow morning? Um, you know, I, at least myself, I try to be as accommodating as possible um, because people have lives and deadlines get missed. There was one ZBA candidate that didn't realize they had to submit an SOI. No matter how many times I wrote and said, you must submit one. Right. When it wasn't submitted, they wrote and said, oh, I didn't know I had to. <laughs> so it was late. <laughs> Those are just a few examples from the last couple months. And you send reminders to all the every every candidate generally the couple days before they're due reminding them that the SOI deadline is approaching. I do my best um, to give people as much notice and as much information as possible. Um, yeah, I think the other advantage of the of the official posting is that it, it involves not just the ch chair or their designee, but also involves the the town clerk, uh, the council clerk, um, and there's a certain finality to it that you can say to someone, "Look, you know, we did everything we could, the deadlines, etc." And there's still was some time even after the deadline, but once this gets put up publicly, that's all. That's it. It's done. There's nothing we can do. Um, so. Um, whereas with the, the idea of, you know, the, the chair sets a deadline, it's somewhat arbitrary, um, and then they can maybe change it a little bit if they want, um, that is, makes people a little nervous. Um, and here, at least the chair says, look, um, this is, you know, once it goes out to the clerk, that's it. But until then, I will, you know, we'll do what we can. We'll do what we can. Um, it'd be nice if you met the deadline. That would make everybody's life easier, but um, it gives us a little bit of flexibility. Maybe we shouldn't have the sentence at all. Well, let's see what would happen if we took it out. Um, uh, I guess the reason it's here is is really for the public. And for anyone applying, they understand that the deadline is, there is a deadline and they, they're supposed to meet it. Um, and so I guess it's there for that purpose. And for the, the uh, committee or the, the uh, council policies point of view, it does, as Mandy has stated, give a little bit of breathing room to the chair or their designee. So it sends a message to the public and it gives a little bit of breathing space to the uh, to the committee. 
but not much. And once they send it off, they send the SOIs to Athena. That's it. Something comes in the next millisecond, nanosecond, whatever. It's it's too late. It's you know it's gone. It's been it's been sent off. All right. Um, again, it states simply that um, one week in advance, SOIs shall be posted. So the seven days, at least, um, they shall be attached to the public meeting posting to provide additional access by the public. And the chair or designee shall notify the town council the SOIs have been posted. I think that um, if we're moving to number eight, yep. there is a contradiction between number eight and then down below, there's about follow-up questions. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There, um, yeah. somehow in number eight, it allows the committees to uh, allow them or not. And then down below, yep. um, it, does allow them uh yeah i think we need to clarify that to some extent um which i, I, I yeah. personally feel like it needs to be uniform either either we do or we don't okay which i would prefer we do we allow we, them we least. do allow them yeah yeah and you know if you recall the last time we had um, follow up questions, none of us asked them. <laughs> I don't, or maybe one of us asked, asked one. And right. no, I understand. It's like just because we have the ability to doesn't mean that we're going to actually ask them. Right. I, my, yeah. Okay. No, there is a tension here. We need some clarification. Um, I, whoops, I took that sentence, the last sentence of nine. Committee members may be given the opportunity to ask at least one follow-up question in isolation definitely is a problem. I took it at the time to be a reflection of the previous statement that committees may choose to allow, um, but I agree stated by, by itself, it sounds like it's just a blanket permission. Um, uh, but earlier it states that um, the committee shall, uh, where does it say? Um, the recommending committee may, may by the majority, majority vote agree to allow, allow follow-up questions, right? So um, that sentence in nine at the end was uh, meant to be connected to the recommending committee may allow. Um, I, yeah. I'm not sure we need the sentence in nine, but I think Darcy was questioning whether to change the sentence in eight too, right? Yeah, yes, no, I would... Um... <clears throat> I think the purpose of this policy is to make the processes uniform. Right. Um, so I think that's an important, uh, that would be an important difference. And I would like to not give committees the ability to be different from each, each other. I don't know, I don't understand why, why you would decide not to have follow-up questions. Well, my understanding is that the maybe the current CRC process has changed, but at one point um, the process was that these are the agreed upon questions. They're the only questions that can be asked and all candidates will be asked the same questions. That That is the current CRC interview process. They're decided ahead of time, distributed ahead of time, and those are the only questions asked. And I think that was based on the original OCA process. Right, Sarah? Yeah, I just want to say that you know, the original OCA process at that time, OCA felt that um, follow up questions would be open to counselors asking leading questions that had to do with their political bias on something. And at that time, OCA decided that we should try to that that this process was something that we should try to have a level playing field with so that members of the public could see that um, the decisions that we were making were not, um, 
that they they followed a, um, some rules that had uh, a fairness level that sort of um, precluded um, excessive, I don't know, political bias so that you knew that somebody wouldn't just knock you out, I don't know, for some arbitrary reason. So that's why we we didn't want to have counselors at that level to be able to ask some kind of a, a question about, uh, you know, something like, how do you feel about the ugly buildings or mm -hmm. I don't know, no, for real, you know, like, no, right. like that, where it, it not only it revealed not only a counselor's bias at that point, but also um, someone who was applying. And, and I think that what we didn't want to have is that the members of the public would feel that, well, this is just the same as a select board. You know, you can just get knocked out in the very first round for a political opinion that you have. So that's, that's where that originally came from. And again, things have evolved since then. So Sarah, how do you feel about um, that evolution and whether, because the argument here is that there should be the opportunity for some kind of follow-up question um, other than what has been presented to them in writing and that all of them have to respond to. There should be a little bit more give and take, a little bit more of a more natural interview process. And while it's not perfectly natural and never will be, um, this idea of a follow-up question gives the counselor um, the opportunity to ask something um, and puts the uh, person being interviewed a bit on the spot. Um, in other words, they get potentially a question or more than one question perhaps that they had not had a chance to sort of prepare. Um, so there's a certain element of spontaneity and sort of a sense of getting a better idea of how this person thinks um, on the fly um, as opposed to, because we've had experiences where people just read, read a statement, they just read a statement. And it, it, to my mind, that's just a colossal. I mean, just submit the damn statement. We'll read it. We can read it at home. Um, but we've given the question in advance, and some of them just write out an answer. And even the ones who don't write out an answer probably rehearse their answer pretty carefully. So we get kind of a canned response. Um, and then there's no chance to say, well, you just said X. What about Y? There's no chance to say, or just ask another question. That's it. So I almost feel like, well, let's just have this go away, just get rid of the first one of you part of it and just have them send us written responses to questions that we, we create the questions, they send us the responses. We don't need to do the interviews. So I, I don't like that, but if it's all just set questions, then why not just have them send us their responses and we don't have to go through all the interview you know, headaches scheduling them blah 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 i mean that that's a really good question i mean you do want to you do want to elicit um genuine answers from people right. um you know i think that when oko originally did it we had the discussion of the fact that some people express themselves much better in speaking mm -hmm. right? right um and then some people express themselves better in writing right and so we were trying to somehow i mean if you can't keep you know equal you know what is it that uh i don't know fair doesn't mean or equal doesn't mean the same mm -hmm. um so that's you know that's difficult how do we get each person to be able to depending on how their brain works express themselves the the best way um so you know I guess if, you know, I know a lot of people want to have that second question because they want to, you know, elicit more from a person or they want to have spontaneity. And in, in some ways, I guess that's okay as long as you've given the person who expresses themselves better in writing a chance to write their SOI yeah, and well, they can. shine. And, you know, I'm not sure because how things work in fairness in theory and how they work in fairness in reality are two very different things. And I think that when we look at the entire process, right? Um, since the town council right now is not bound, when all of us come right down to it, right? When we are all counselors sitting in a room and we're making a decision and we're making a decision that supports our 
the our political policy that is a policy we were elected on, a lot of this is going to go out the window. So I think that my fight in trying to keep uh, bias questions out, I think is now I, I see that it's a ridiculous point no. because people, people, you know, counselors want to know and people and counselors ask those questions consistently. Mm -hmm. So on this, I feel like it's a, uh, that perhaps the way that I'm viewing this is a little pie in the sky and it's not realistic. It just isn't. So, you know, I guess I'm willing to give on that um, because I'm not running again. I'm not running again because, you know, a lot of the ideas that I have, I, I you know, as far as politics go, are, are not practical. And I don't know that they're forwarding what I believe in politically. So mm -hmm. this is something I, I guess I'm willing to let go because I, the majority is opposed to it. And I guess I'm not sure that it actually works in reality. Well, I'm not clear where the majority is. You may be right. But um, what I'm hearing you say is that um, you're open to or willing to accept the idea of um, just across the board, in addition to the uh, stated um, adopted interview questions, you are willing to uh, accept a second round of questioning or a second opportunity to ask any question, or we we'll call a follow-up question, mm -hmm. but essentially is a second question that is not a question that has been presented to the candidate in advance. You're willing to, to accept that, but you, like Darcy, would like this to apply to all committees it can't be it shouldn't be left up to the committee to decide this either it's the rule for everybody or one way or the other is what i'm hearing from you so if you want me to stand on my principle i do yep. not think we should have follow-up questions okay all right but that's, you know yeah. I, okay that's that's good okay um mandy your hand was up go ahead yeah um if the goal is consistency and that all the interviews look the same, right. um, I would eliminate follow-up questions. Um, if we're, I, you know, I, I, I'm willing to allow the possibility as long as each committee can choose itself, but having experienced interviews for, I, I, given what committees I sit on, I have in the last six months completed interviews for finance, um, and or or recommendation process for all four committees: DAB, Finance, CR, uh, Planning Board, and ZBA. Right. And they are all very different committees, um, and they all have very different applicant numbers. Um, and they all, in the past, did things differently. But I think follow-up questions can be. And I apologize for this phone. Um, follow-up questions can be good, but. If you're in a situation where you're interviewing six or seven people for two spots, and you're already at two plus hours of interviews, to then allow five different people to ask follow-up questions of six or seven people, I think it becomes extremely long, potentially mm -hmm. not um, good for the candidates, and as, as Sarah was saying, potentially not equitable. Um, so if I had to go one way or the other for consistency's sake, I'd go no follow-up interviews, no follow-up questions. Hmm. Um, so I, in some sense, I kind of like this, you know, I, I know we're looking for consistency, but I like this option because it allows each committee to look at the current pool and say, you know, and consider a whole bunch of things as to whether follow-up questions are logical based on the questions that were decided on or not. Um, based on the size of the interview pool, based on the availability of the candidate. Sometimes it's, you know, the candidate can show up for that interview at eight, but has to leave by 9.30. You know, oh, if you had follow-up questions, maybe one candidate's already out by then. Um, so they they are allowed to look at the inter, inter, individual circumstances of each particular um, process and all to make that decision. But I would go with Sarah if we want consistency and say no. So let me give you a hypothetical or not hypothetical, just an example. Um, what do we do with people who are seeking reappointment? Um, a question that I would like to ask them would not be appropriate to ask of the other candidates. Um, does that mean that, that the kind of question that I'd like to ask, which would be, tell us something that, you know, like with finance, for instance, tell us something that, that you've learned from your experience for the last two years that you found 
particularly, you know, uh, surprising or, you know, some whatever. Uh, tell us, in other words, a question basically designed to elicit from them uh, something that they've learned or, or, you know, whatever, or advice they might like to give. Um, and that's a question I can't ask the other candidates because uh, in this scenario, uh, they're not seeking reappointment, they're new candidates. So how does that play out? Um, does that mean I can't ask those questions? Um, so uh, yeah, right? I, I go back to the questions that CRC asked when it had a mixed pool for both ZBA and um, yeah, yeah. planning board, which was questions that said, in answering these questions, please rely on your experience, your attendance at planning board or ZBA okay. meetings in this town or other towns. And so, you give okay. them the opening right. in the question itself to say, right. for those that have served to say, in the last two years, here's what I've learned. And for those that haven't to say, hey, I've been on other boards in other towns, or I've been yeah. going to planning board meetings for the last year, you give them the opening within the standard question to be able to tailor it to their individual experience. Okay. And, right. and, plan and for those interviews, um, we got what you're looking for, George, from the candidates that were seeking reappointment and from candidates that were seeking original appointment, we got that variety using the experience that they had had either sitting on a board for the last two years or one year, and those that hadn't that maybe had attended meetings. We, we got that. So what I'm hearing from you is that in your experience, which is I think the, the broadest of anyone here, and at least of this committee, um, so we've all been involved in these interviews, um, in your experience, um, following uh, adopted interview questions without um, follow-up, um, gives you more than enough information, um, even though the format is somewhat, you know, rigid and somewhat artificial. Um, it's not a true back and forth. You feel that for the purpose of time and also in the sense of fairness, um, both to the other committee members um, who could be victimized by a member of their committee going off on a tangent um, and or the, the people being interviewed, they know what they're getting into. And so you would prefer um, basically not having this idea of follow-up questions. I would choose no follow-up questions if we don't want to give the committees the options themselves. Right. Otherwise, so, I would okay. leave okay. it with the option. But if we're picking one or the other, I would pick no follow-up. And Sarah, excuse me, uh, Darcy, you feel that giving the committee a choice makes you uncomfortable because that sort of whole point is to have a, a consistent policy across the board. And now we have under interview number eight, we have a policy that kind of goes two ways at once. And so you would not be happy with allowing the committee to decide, um, but you um, either have it one way or the other, but not leaving it up to the committee. Darcy. Yes. Um, uh, I think that the only reason for um, I guess I feel like the only reason for not allowing follow-up questions is uh, time. So uh, mm -hmm. I I would say you know time permitting follow follow-up questions are allowed. But um, I also wanted to let you know that I have a hard stop at twelve thirty, okay. and so I will be leaving at twelve thirty. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. No, no, that's no reason to apologize. We we're supposed to be done at twelve thirty. And this has taken longer than we expected, but it's, I think it's been very fruitful, but um, all right. So with eight suggestions as how to proceed. Um, I think we might all be in agreement of eliminating the last sentence of number nine. Um, committee members may be given, so we could take, let's just for the moment strike that, that's okay. Um, Prior to holding interviews, the recommended committee shall by majority vote adopt interview questions, which will be asked to all applicants. The recommended committee may by majority vote. So this is the, the question, this is the sentence at, at, at issue here. Um, may by majority vote agree to allow follow-up questions by committee members during the interviews. Um, people want to strike it. They want to um, keep it. They want to, what do they want to do? Darcy, please. Just make, oh, yeah, oh, I didn't know that was a, it just oh, needs sorry. to be, it just needs to be uniform. So it would be right. Right. Um, one or the other rule. Um, 
for all of the committees. So it would be something to the effect that follow-up questions uh, uh, may be permitted or are permitted, or um, committee members may each ask a, a, a follow-up question. Time permitting. Time permitting. So it could be, let me just write this and we'll just so time permitting, but again, that again, okay, let's just do it. Time permitting um, each committee member may ask a follow up, up question. It shall be given the opportunity to ask a follow up question shall would be, be the given, wording. Yeah, that's right. If, if you're going with, they have yeah. to be able to. I'm permitting each committee member shall be given the opportunity to ask a follow up question. Okay, what do people think of that? I mean, I can think right away, you know, here and I then am. You, so, you know, so the proposal is that and then delete the highlighted sentence, right? Yeah, that's right, exactly. But I'm thinking right away, you know, here I am with a whole bunch of really, I want to ask this question, that question, and the chair lets uh, say, Sarah, ask a question, and then the chair says, oh, we're out of time. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, but that's, the, you know, that's what would happen. And I could just live with it, and I, I could live with it, I'm sure. But that's, you know, as opposed to, it's going to take as long as it takes. Everybody oh, are you saying are you saying that one counselor gets to to ask a follow up question and then we run out of time and then exactly. you can't yeah I can't oh. ask mine you know or Darcy oh. you have a question you really want to ask and Mandy asks says anybody and I raise my hand so I ask my question and it takes a minute or two and then Mandy says oh we're out of time well that's time permitting you just think about how many you know you're like okay with that you're okay with that you're okay with it. it's like, well why didn't she like, ask me if there only if there are only two or three applicants and yeah. you know okay. then you can right. go crazy with them okay well all right that's just it <laughs> so i i don't support the change personally okay um, i just thought i'd say that um so you i would like go the other idea. way and not allow them at all for consistency but because again, your concern is time. I mean, it's just there's you <laughs> deal with very large numbers of people, and, and it's and not just time. Not just it's, time. Yeah. it's many much of what Sarah said too. Even though I'm the one that argues at the council level, it's political appointments. I, right. I, I see our committees attempting to, especially with planning board and ZBA, the questions that are asked have been really try to elicit non-political opinions in a sense. Um, I don't know whether okay. Sarah agrees with the questions, but we worked hard on these questions to, okay. Okay. to get general ideas of how they would approach decisions, not what their particular views are on things, but um, you know, it's- So I what I'm hearing- I see asking yeah, follow-up questions. I'm hearing here from both Sarah and Mandy, and potentially from Darcy, who simply wants a consistent policy, that what this could read is that um, the recommended committee shall by adopt interview questions will be asked to all applicants. And then all of this, well, this is an addition, but I mean, just all this goes away. The committee shall consider the adopted selection guidance and developing the questions. The committee shall also solicit questions from the town council in advance, attempt to include them, but that would be part of our creation of the questions. Um, before they submit it to the candidates. Time limits for answering these questions may be set prior to interviews. Then, uh, uh, so then this sentence gets stricken and um, this committee members will ask the adopt interview questions of each applicant and each applicant will have between. I mean, I don't know why this is here, but I guess it's all right. I mean, it basically just says that, yeah, okay. I mean, who else is gonna ask them? Um, I guess the idea is that the chair alone doesn't get to ask them or the right, each member gets to ask a question. I don't know, I'm not sure why this is here. Meetings will be videotaped and this sentence would be stricken. And what this policy now states is that the questions are selected and are decided upon in advance. They're sent to the candidates and they are, uh, that's it. And that those are the questions that'll be asked. There'll be no follow-up questions. And uh, that's what I'm hearing from at least two, maybe three of you. Look, George, can I say one more Please. thing? I know I'm not making this easy. 
but herein lies the rub. So if I'm saying, look, I don't want, when the entire council votes, I'd like counselors to be thinking about certain ideas of fairness that, that transcend what we as counselors um, hold as right. our right. political convictions, right? right. So that right. we might be giving a chance to someone who is maybe doesn't support our views at the time, but we think is a good thinker and might be able to, you know, change their mind on certain things, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of what mm -hmm. we're looking for. That's what mm -hmm. we were asked to do. Mm -hmm. So if it, what it looks like is going to happen is that when we are all sitting down as a group to make these decisions, we are allowed to make the, this, all of the stuff that went beforehand could just be washed away if we are going to appoint people that simply follow our political convictions. If that is the case and that's what it's looking like, then it seems a little bit more fair then, I guess, to ask to, to include when a committee is deciding, maybe it's better that we know people's political views who are applying, because then when it comes to the full council and counselors make decisions, then they're going to have to stand by the point, as if, if it is their point, that they are recommending someone regardless of the other um, good things or bad things about that, that would recommend them, that those things are actually pushed aside for most counselors by the fact that either you support the political view that I support because I was elected to do that or not. So in some ways, maybe it, it gives uh, for the for citizens, it, get, it shows, it gives, I guess, some accountability for counselors about how they're voting because it would be easy to say, oh, you know, I don't think I like Jan Smith. You know, I don't think she has the right qualifications when in reality, Jan Smith is, is just a, the person that just will never support the things that you as a politician and as a resident and as a counselor feel are incredibly important. So that's, see, that's where it's, that's where it's hard for me. And I'm. Well, Sarah, why couldn't you not say that at the actual council vote where actually you are justifying or explaining the vote that you're about to, to cast. But at, what we're looking at is the process prior to that and um, what I'm hearing from some of the members here, and I'm even myself somewhat leaning towards now, is, is creating a process where the questions are fixed in advance and you don't have that kind of give and take and follow up, but um, it, it creates a, a level playing field and um, the committee will spend uh, sufficient time, has spent and will spend sufficient time in advance crafting questions that they're satisfied by, but they also know that those are the questions that are gonna be asked. There won't be any surprise questions, there won't be any grandstanding, any sort of, you know, uh, right? And I think there's a, an attraction to that, which is something you've been, I think, supportive for a long time. This process would, would guarantee that, but the actual decision when it comes to voting, you are perfectly free as a counselor, and I would think your point is you should as a counselor, if you're going to vote for X, vote against X or vote whatever, you should explain your vote. But that's so the I point guess, where you do it, not not right. at this point in the process, but at that point where you're voting. But here, the process we're, we're thinking of creating would have something that you've kind of pushed for for a long time, which is kind of this level playing field. Everybody knows what to expect. Um, and, and we just need to craft good questions in advance. So, and I agree on that if this yep. policy were for the entire council and that every single council, when it comes time for us to vote together was held to considering all of the things that the committee considered. Because if you're, if, if all of town council is considering the things that we are, then that transcends our political beliefs. And it allows us to perhaps give a chance to someone who might be an incredibly intelligent person with a thinking mind who may disagree with us sometimes, but has an open mind and may agree with us. And it brings people together. And I think that 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 if the if if as counselors, when it comes to voting altogether, we are not also following these, then what can happen is that it could be a contentious vote. 
and someone could say, hey, you know, Mary Jane, gosh, she's just so wonderful, but I can't because blah, 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 blah reason that hides the fact that what it really comes down to is they don't agree with them politically. And again, yeah. I'm saying this and this is yeah. what I think, but I don't think it's practical. I don't, I, I'm okay. telling you what I wish yeah. the way I wish the world was, but I don't think it's practical. And that's why okay. I have a hard time with it. Okay. Um, I think we need, Darcy needs to leave. Um, we're not going to vote on this today, obviously. I don't think we should vote on it without Darcy being present. Um, she's certainly free to weigh in on that, but I feel that that's something we're gonna have to come back to. We're almost there, I think. Uh, I thought we were almost there at the beginning of tonight. Sorry, but I'm sorry. That's all right. No, 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 no. You, you, we've all been involved in this. Um, so we're going to have to leave this, I think, where it is and allow Darcy to exit the meeting. I need to um, check with the rest of you whether you can stay a few extra minutes to at least get the minutes approved. And perhaps if we have time to look at the ROP, which I don't think would be uh, too lengthy a matter, but um, that's just a suggestion. So first of all, Darcy needs to go. Um, uh, are people okay with, I just don't think we can vote on this today. I, I mean, I'm in some sense okay with it, yet we spent the last meeting all two hours on this too, with know, one I member know. absent and I we're know. back here. And given everything else that's coming that has deadlines, I yes, yes, I yes. don't want to, I, I almost want to go immediately to a vote at the next meeting. Like it's where it is. Well, we still have a decision to make about it. If we, we start, if we start like we did today, it's going to be another two hours discussing no. the same exact things over and over again. No, no we, we will not do that. I can promise you as chair, we will start with the yeah. interview question and we need to resolve that. We haven't resolved it yet. We could try to resolve, I think Darcy has already left, correct? Um, so yeah. um, we could try to resolve it. We could continue with this today and, and come uh, up Athena with Athena might not be able to with her hand raised. Athena, please go ahead. Sorry, yeah, you're right. I have a audit RFP at one o'clock. It would be great if you were able to wrap up a few minutes before that so I can have a quick bite, <laughs> have some lunch before that meeting begins, but I will need to start that Zoom um, a few minutes before one. Okay. okay. So I'll have to kick you off at that point. I what I hesitate to suggest is maybe GOL needs another meeting in September. Okay. Um, in other words, we could meet a week from today um, and get this done. And yeah. Could, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know right. we have to let Athena go, but I also agree with Mandy Joe. If we keep doing this, we're going to have two hour conversation. I mean, I've done this for three years. We could do it for another three. I think that the important thing is, is that this gets out to the rest of the council and then we have it out. I, I just. I agree with you, but we still have an issue. Um, interview question section is not correct. I mean, it, it needs to be fixed. Um, do we want to allow um, follow up questions? What I'm hearing from some members is no. Um, and, and from others I'm hearing, maybe yes. Darcy's a yes. Sarah, after your very nice argument, are you switching to yes from now? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, then this one, I'll support the rest of the committee and I, and I will vote yes to get this through. Well, um, well I'm just that, wondering, I think that we should question. do it at the next the meeting. Interview. I guess is what I'm no, saying is yeah, I would right. go with the majority on this. And then if we, if somebody calls the question at the beginning of the next meeting, I'm going to roll with it because I don't think, I know, I hate to say this. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm no, not, no. we're never going to, we are never going to finish this. We are never going to all agree on this. It has to get out. And then at some point, I th think we just have to have some faith. Okay. Well, what I'm hearing for number eight is, uh, and weigh in if you disagree, that the majority would like this to simply state that um, they're, they're, you will just ask, you will only ask the agreed upon interview questions um, and the rest of it. That's probably. what I was trying to establish. George, are you that, is that where you are or are you on follow-up? Uh, I, I think at this point I'm willing to go with just accept, just doing the, the adopted interview questions. Your, your experience and that you've had is, is convincing me that, that if we do spend the time that in the past and as under my chairmanship perhaps we haven't done quite so well and that's on me if we spend the time crafting the interview questions carefully then then my concerns are are pretty much met um and so i would probably go with just dealing with the adopted interview questions no follow-ups um and hopefully the council will agree with us um but i would vote for that i would put that language in and take out the follow-up language um, sounds like Mandy would do that. Sounds like Sarah would do that. 
and I don't know where Darcy stands. I think Darcy simply felt one way or the other. So this is one way or the other. It's just, it's gonna be for all committees, um, you know, just the adopted questions. Um, and then, uh, and I can, you know, I think that the language is just, has been stricken and highlighted can be taken out. Um, the only other question under number nine was what to do with applicant pool is closed at the time. I felt that should be moved up somewhere else. It should be um, perhaps um, right up here, I think. I don't know where, I don't know where the hell it should be. I was gonna move it. <laughs> I guess in statement, um, to the, statement of interest. To yeah. the paragraph right before number eight, all applicant yep, right SOI right. shall be posted at the same right. time, at least one week advance. That's where you can add that sentence. Yeah, the applicant pool is closed at the time. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I was going to edit this. I was going to take this out, cut, and um, I'm sorry. Where will you say is in seven? Applicants are posting the SOS should be attached to the um, uh, The committee chair then you shall notify, right? And then I was going to insert it here. I was going to insert it. It can here. go right at the end of that paragraph. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. And I was going to take out the highlighting. So, can I have a suggestion? Yep. I know Darcy's not here and I know Pat's not here. We'd kind of like this to be over. Yeah. We can do a vote now to recommend or not. And then George as chair, as you're writing the report, even though the official vote would be whatever the three members of us vote, put in and poll Darcy and Pat for what their vote would be mm. and put that in the report. All right, that's one option. Uh, we could have the vote. Um, we still haven't gone through. Um, let me see. It's just Interview the committee report. appointment recommendations. That's it. Because um, we determined the appendix we're not doing now. We're waiting for the policy to be adopted before we do. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me. Um, so I want to clean this up. I don't want us voting on something that we haven't cleaned up. So I want to delete that somehow. Let me just cut it. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know why this refuses to show in black. Well, it's because it's a copy paste and, and you're tracking changes, George. That's okay. it. Okay. All right. So and I'm gonna just you're just tracking changes. When you accept all the changes, things will look right. Thank you. Um, let me just get rid of that. I don't look at that with it. Um, I'm gonna go up here and accept all changes. Uh, review. Well, I can just do accept all changes and stop tracking. The other thing, Mandy, how do I get rid of all the comments? You'll just delete them. You can't, it, it takes can't a little bit of cleaning okay. up after. Do it later. Okay. Do it all uh, later is what I would I, say. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And we're going to take away this date. So this is town council policy, make a recommendation of town council appointments to multiple member bodies as amended on August 25th, 2021. Um, I'm going to make a motion that we accept this document as Recommend. amended. Recommend the council adopt. Adopt this uh, document as amended. Um, I'll recommend second. It. And Mandy seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to go to a vote. I'm going to start with the chair. The chair votes yes. Mandy. Aye. Sarah. Aye. The vote is three in favor, none opposed, two absent. What Mandy is suggesting is that I reach out to the two members absent, send them a copy of this document and ask them if they were present, how they would have voted. And then I would include that in my report or no. What yes. I'm not sure. Yes, I would. Okay. So the vote was three to zero and two members were polled and they would have voted uh, X, Y, or Z. And then I will write the report and present it to the council at the next council meeting. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Can we let Athena go, even if we don't do minutes? Yeah, and I guess the question is, do we want to declare, we'll have another meeting, uh, or we want to hope to get all this done. With this out of the way, hopefully we can make good progress. We will have, just heads, heads up to the other two of you, we should have two zoning amendments to review, We uh, and we would have the rule of procedure to uh, look at. Okay. We're hoping for three, George. You just don't have the third yet. 
And so I'm going to send that to Paul. In a week, you'll get the third, okay. hopefully. In a week, okay. September 1st. All right, so that's- Waiting on the planning board. Three zoning amendments. Uh, the ROP can wait if we have to. That's not the most pressing thing. That can wait if we have to boot it. But the zoning amendments can't. And this has been settled. Um, and then we have a town manager a goals referral, which again is, is something we can deal with at a later date if we have to. So I guess basically the next meeting is going to be on um, the, uh, the zoning amendments. I can stay later for that if we want to plan it, depending on what we have, because I don't think it's going to be short, but I just want to get it over with. <laughs> I hate to say that, but some of these things are just so emotionally taxing yeah. that I just feel like if we all listen to each other and we're yeah. moderate, let's get it done. Okay. So you're saying that at the next meeting, which is September 8th, you could hang later if you have to. Yep. Um, we want to get these three zoning amendments out of the way if we get them. And um, I need a report to be submitted to the council for September 13. And anything else? Okay. All right. Um, we'll worry about minutes another day, unless you want to. I've looked at them; they're fine. If you want to just have a vote, we can. We can just uh, make the motion. I'm going to move that we approve the minutes of July 28th as presented. I made no changes. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, vote, I'll start with Sarah. Aye. And Mandy. Aye. And George is an aye, the chair is an aye. So it's three zero two absent. The minutes have been approved. I will send those on. And Anything just else? note yeah. for the record, there's no public for public comment. Thank you for checking. I got that, thank you. All right, so let Athena go. Let the, the two of you go. Thank you all for your hard work today and see you uh, on September. Eighth. Thanks, everyone. Bye.